So still staying along the theme on a passive short of instruments, we did solar, we did uh, thermal, and so what's next? Say it louder. Microwave. Microwave, right. So now we're going to maybe go with Mark. Yes. Oh, it's up. Sorry. It's up. <laughs> Thanks for stopping. <laughs> so I'm going to focus mostly on passive microwave, although those who know me best know that I'm inherently pessimistic with only using passive microwave. It's inherently a very synergistic uh, way we use it. But I'll talk about microwave remote sensing of clouds, and I put parenthetically precipitation in there because cloud properties and precipitation are inherently linked, and the microwave is relatively strong and looking at precipitation issues. And throughout the talk, I will give capabilities, limitations, and other random topics that I'll cover. So if we look at the microwave imager data set, the historical data set, we actually have a pretty strong record now going on from 1987 onward. And I've listed here a lot of the different microwave imagers that uh, have flown on different platforms from the SSMI in 1987, late 80s, 90s, all the way down to the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission Microwave Imager, which is the GMI, which will actually launch in a couple of months, February 2014. And these sensors have largely had the same channel selection throughout the years. I did note, though, at the end here, a couple of these new sensors, SSMIS and GMI, actually have a couple of higher frequency channels which are good in that they're more sensitive to ice scattering, which gives us more information content. We also have a sounder data set that's fairly rich from the late 1970s on. The sounders, however, are not historically used much for cloud properties. They are used to look at things like ice water path and to estimate precipitation. But these are cross-track scanners which, with larger footprints, but they do have some use, and I'll actually talk about those a little bit as well later. Just a general overview of the microwave spectrum. This is actually pillaged from Grant Petty's textbook, which I always tout as available for $35 from Sun Dog Publishing. It's a very good price. And what it does show is the microwave spectrum for the range that we typically use with instruments that are flying today, from low frequencies, under 10 gigahertz, all the way up to higher frequencies, approaching 200 gigahertz. Where you see the solid line here is the atmospheric opacity, again, for low frequencies. Down here, we use these in the microwave community for surface properties to retrieve things like sea ice, soil moisture, things like that. In the mid range of the frequencies, from about 20 gigahertz upward, we actually have strong sensitivity to cloud liquid water. So that's information that we use in this frequency range. And then for the higher frequencies, generally greater than about 80 gigahertz in the microwave spectrum, those are sensitive to ice particle scattering. So it's the final piece of the puzzle that microwave imagers and sounders use to look at uh, cloud property retrievals. The other thing that I'll remind you as I talk about microwave comparing it to IR, especially the imagers, is we have large footprint sizes. So all of the strengths that I give you today about the microwave retrievals just remember that our main weakness is actually footprint size from a technology standpoint. We really struggle with that. And I think there are a lot of microwave remote sensing people who literally commit high crimes to get the footprint sizes that you get in the infrared. So keep that in mind. Well, high crime, well, that's for discussion later. So just a, another broad overview of some of the retrievables that we get from microwaves. I would be remiss if I didn't put these images on here because these are very important low frequencies where the atmosphere is generally immune transparent right to microwave radiation emitted from the Earth atmosphere system. On the upper left, things like sea surface temperature, uh, surface wind speed, sea ice content. These are all made possible by microwaves at the low frequencies under most weather conditions. So that's a huge advantage compared to other sensors. From an atmospheric perspective, things that uh, we're more, I guess, amenable to talking to today are things like water vapor amount, water column, water vapor, cloud liquid water, and also rain rate precipitation. These are all typical products produced from microwave sensors and are readily available now for the, the time period from the late 1980s on. I like to 
this graphic. This is actually from a comment module that I found over the weekend. Again, we're reminded of the difference between what we're looking at, what information we're actually getting from something like an infrared on the left versus a microwave image on the right. Infrared sensitive to cloud top properties. The main advantage of the microwave is that you're actually getting a column integrated property. And I guess this is both a, a blessing and a curse in a way for the microwave because you're very sensitive physical details of what's in that cloud. In this case, this is showing a rendition of a 37 gigahertz microwave channel where you have strong emission from raindrops and cloud with water below the freezing level that gets emitted upwards and largely doesn't interact with ice particles above it, which gives us a nice liquid water retrieval capability. Now, at higher frequencies, you actually need a lot of scattering of that radiation that's emitted from the lower levels of the cloud. And that's other information contact that you can gather and use in actual retrievals for things like surface, rain, surface rainfall rates. I'd like to show this plot because it shows you the multi-frequency spectrum of a typical cloud of precipitation case. This is actually in the southern hemisphere, showing six different frequencies from the Amster E microwave radiometer. And I believe this is the island of Tasmania. South American or South uh, Hemispheric Centric. I think that's definitely But what it shows going from left to right on the top are 6 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, 18 gigahertz, on the bottom 23, 36, 89. And what you see are as you increase the microwave frequency, the more stuff you see in the atmosphere. It's more sensitive to things like water vapor, cloud liquid water, and then ice particles as you go upward with frequency. The other thing to note which is the bane of many microwave remote sensing review experts, is land. It's very highly emissive, and that complicates the signals. So a big drawback with microwaves are we often can't get retrievals over land. That's a huge drawback compared to other instruments. Again, something to keep in mind going forward. This is a nice plot of that same case showing uh, another piece of information contact that we get from passive microwave, and that's the polarization difference. This is showing the 89 gigahertz channel, vertical minus horizontal polarization. It's another piece of information that we use. A microwave radiometer is generally looking obliquely, the conically scanning ones anyway, compared to the, the sounders that are cross -trend. When you're looking at the ocean surface at an oblique angle, you get a nice polarization difference off of the sea surface. Clouds and precipitation, on the other hand, in areas that are blue over here, show very little polarization diversity. And that's telling you that there are things like clouds and atmospheric constituents in the atmosphere. And if you overlay a retrieval, this is a liquid water path with microwave radiometer. Again, it correlates really nicely with the lack of polarization diversity. So that's another uh, crucial piece of information that we use for precipitation in cloud liquid water retrievals in microwaves. And finally, another picture showing this is both the tropics, the last piece of that earlier, this is the 89 gigahertz brightness temperature showing a lot of strong brightness temperature depressions over obviously cloud precipitation areas. And this is the ice scattering signature that we also use as well. And uh, is actually the main physical basis for overland microwave precipitation retrievals. So now look at the uh, let's look at some of the climate or the capabilities more long range of a lot of these, what are some of the kind of the climate scale properties that we can retrieve using microwave information. Now, this is a liquid water path climatology. This is actually published by a former SCC researcher, Chris O'Dell, who's at uh, Colorado State University. He published a nice paper in the late 2000s showing mean liquid water path trends using a historical data set of microwave uh, data that, in this case, I think it was 1998 onwards, but that can pushed back uh, a lot further than the, the 90s. There are some limitations with this liquid water path. Again, it's strongly uh, dependent on that emission signal that you're getting from below the freezing level. Microwaves are good at seeing that at the lower frequencies. And some of the limitations are actually partitioning between where it's rain and only a liquid cloud that's not precipitating. And there's about 15 to 30 percent errors related to that, that partitioning zone between non-precipitating and precipitating. Uh, 
uh, footprint size again, 10 to 30 kilometer footprint sizes for the main frequencies that we use in things like cloud and water paths. So that's a, a large equalizer when you think about things like beam filling. Cloud temperatures, there's a lot of effects with absorption properties of cloud and water that depend on the temperature. And you can get fairly substantial errors related to those features as well. And clear sky biases, if Tom is here, Greenwald, Tom has done a lot of good work on uh, looking at microwave retrieval that should say zero liquid water path, but actually don't under clear sky conditions. We have some issues with uh, clear sky biases that need to be cleaned up as well. And finally, over ocean only. We can only get retrievals where we get that polarization diversity and uh, avoiding that strong emissive property of the land and ice surfaces that complicates our task. So to kind of summarize this section, and I'll do this for all the other sections that talk about synergies, there's a lot of synergies that are available here. I put MODIS down, or this IR, just because you can look at that beam filling issue by plugging in the gaps with MODIS pixels and these larger microwave pixels. We have things like Cloud7 and Calypso that are active, that are actually very high resolution, meaning the full vertical profile, or almost the full vertical profile of the atmosphere to help fill in some of these gaps. I'm assuming Bob and Tristan will probably both talk about this as well. Other capabilities. Andy actually mentioned this earlier. We can do ice water path retrievals using microwave. And these are usually using the highest frequency channels, mostly on the sounders, 150 gigahertz or so, subtracting 89 gigahertz or so. These are fairly simplistic at this stage. They're looking at brightness temperature differences between those two frequencies as a proxy for how much ice water content you have in the atmosphere. I'll go right away to the limitations of this, however. These require high frequency channels, and they've only really been available on sounders over the past, I don't know, 20 years or so. Some of the imagers are finally getting some of these high frequency channels, so we have a more a fighting chance to see some of these retrievals work a little bit better with uh, the imagers versus sounders. The other thing that Andy mentioned very nicely is that we're sensitive only to larger ice particles. In this case, on the order of one millimeter or so, or precipitation size particles. And the question to ask then is, our ice water path the same as your ice water path, looking at different sensors? Very different answers um, from near IR, viz, IR, versus our microwave retrievals as well. Our ice water paths are only sensitive to the larger particles, we're missing a large part of the smaller particle spectrum. And then a topic that's near and dear to my heart, we can spend 25 minutes talking about this, are scattering differences between different ice particles in the atmosphere and how that affects the signature that we see in the passive microwaves. There are huge uncertainties related to uh, physical scattering differences between different types of ice atoms that limits the efficacy of these ice water paths. Synergies, again, I'm always going to come back to active. Using active with passive helps eliminate some of these uncertainties or beats them down, provides constraints. And a new synergy that I'll put on this ice water path are actually submillimeter, getting uh, observations into the submillimeter range of the spectrum to help constrain these scattering issues with ice water path. And then the final capability that I'd like to briefly talk about is rainfall rate. This is actually a uh, uh, pseudo-climatology from the last, so 1998 to 2011, using the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission as the hinge point, the linchpin of the observations to look at global rainfall rate. And another plot that I put a question mark, surface snowfall. We have this mission coming up, the GPM mission, that's tasked to produce trim tropical rainfall measuring rate, rain make uh, trim-like observations at higher latitudes. The lucky thing for us in the passive community is right now we're tasked with only detecting snowfall and not actually providing uh, actual quantitative estimates at this point. It's a very tough task. This is a plot uh, made by Boucher and Lou at Florida State that shows some possibility of providing a probability of snowfall at the surface using passive only. But this is a topic that's really in its infancy. So some of the limitations on precipitation ret retrieval, we really rely on a priori databases in our retrieval methodology a lot of these are uh, coming from models, from mesoscale models, and the microphysics included in those models. We don't know if they're entirely realistic for all situations. We don't know if they're representative. We 
also have passive and active combined together that are making databases for these retrievals. And uh, I'll hint on something a little bit later here that shows how clouds that can help in that respect. Also, comparing different things, instantaneous precipitation rates versus long-term versus different algorithms. Depending on what you're comparing, you can see wildly different uh, comparisons. Uncertainties ranging from as little as 10% to upwards of 50 to 100%. So you have to pay attention to what you're actually comparing and how you're trying to characterize the uncertainty of these retrievals. Land versus ocean is huge. We actually have physically different algorithms operating on land versus ocean historically. So that can be a, a huge uh, increase in congruous rainfall rate retrievals between land and ocean. Also looking at different regimes of precipitation, uh, different regional differences. We struggle with light precipitation, and we struggle with shallow precipitation as well. And then finally, ice scattering, which I alluded to before. And I want to make a strong plug for validation. The data sets that we're using to validate and to evaluate these retrievals are often fraught with our own errors and uncertainties, and that's something we always have to be cognizant of as well when we, uh, when we look to validate our ground-based equipment. I'm going to, I think, lead into uh, Bob and Tristan nicely and say that there's a lot of synergy between the actors and the passive. This is just the clouds at overpass over Greenland, showing the nice precipitation event. This is actually snowfall. The bottom floods here are Norwood snowfall retrievals using clouds at, using active-based observations that can help us constrain and can tell us what's actually happening underneath the hood uh, to give us a better constraint for passive microwave. So there's strong synergy between us uh, that we're going to do a lot of work in the uh, future years. I'll end with that. Thanks. Any quick questions for Mark? Well, uh, uh, yep. Uh, Mark, how come it, nobody's done a longer-term climatology? Type of climatology, just any in general? Yeah, anything. Yeah. So the other guys aren't perfect either. So. Right. I, I think our community was initially hampered by a lot of intercalibration issues as well between different sensors. A lot of people have been working on that problem in recent years, and I think that's largely been ironed out. So I think we will see in the next few years a lot more of these extended climatologies. Uh, from a precipitation standpoint, we're really still honing the methodologies at this point. It's a, it's a complex problem. I think I'll just leave it at that. And you'll see a lot more coming out. And I think Tristan will show some active stuff. Bringing in the active with the passive, I think, is really the missing ingredient. We've had that only since about 19.